Bill, please accept my apology for not introducing you earlier. We appreciate you being here representing the uh, Texas Historical Commission. And thank you, everybody, for your patience as we went through this methodical uh, presentation to, to give you some of the background leading up to this project and, and, and how this landscape has changed over time. We believe we've done a considerable amount of due diligence to ensure that there's no adverse effect on, on the resources and the, in the project area. And with that, uh, as promised, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to hear from you. You know, my hope was that we were going to share some information that might address some questions or concerns that might might exist. Uh, I, I suspect that there's uh, questions or concerns that you would like to share. And so uh, I'd like to work this if we can, and I think we can do it in a, in a very organized manner. Justin's going to help me. He has a, a mic microphone, and it's really important that we all be able to hear the question so that uh, we can understand what's being asked or said. And, uh, and then address that. It might be a little bit awkward, but I intend to call upon uh, our staff, our, uh, what I consider expert witnesses on, on certain, depending on what the question and the, and the comments are about. And so uh, with their help, we'll, uh, we'll address them as best we can. So uh, I'll just call on anybody. Wait. Yes, sir, Justin. My name is Bruce Lockett. I just wanted to ask a question. I know they've done an archaeological survey on the site. Uh, we've done historical research for the last three years. I have actually in the Senate, Thomas Orr, was at the Bell of San Jacinto. My question is, Peggy Lake, when going into Peggy Lake, uh, there was a slaughterhouse there. About 300 to 400 Mexican soldiers were killed there with artifacts on them, uh, weapons. And uh, as a Vietnam veteran, I usually carry at least three or four weapons with me. And I'm sure the Mexican soldiers had the same uh, feeling in combat situation. But uh, we noticed at the end of the battle, they were only taking, taking up 600 rifles and a few uh, uh, sabers and swords and stuff. And my question was, where did the other weapons go to? And we, after looking at the situation, there may be as many as 1,500 or at least 1,000 weapons in Peggy Lake that were dropped when the soldiers were killed. And I'm just asking if the Marine Archaeology Department has done any survey on that particular lake or marshy area which has been in that area, if they've done any marine or it might be something they want, may wish to look at and uh, take some technical equipment out there, sonar. We had approached them two years ago about trying to do some stuff with them, but they said you had to have marine archaeologists with, you know, a master's degree and anthropologists with a master's degree. And I understand that. I'm just saying, I think that's a, an area that may have been neglected, not intentionally, but just to make them aware that there are probably historical sites there. Maybe down in the mud, maybe just a couple of feet under the ground. And it's one particular area needs to really be surveyed. Okay, okay. Anybody on our team would like to, to take that on? I'm not, certainly in a better position to address that than me. Michael, thanks. Uh, certainly us and historians are aware of Peggy Lake having been an area where a lot of the Mexican soldiers died. Uh, but Peggy Lake has been, been used as a disposal area by the Corps of Engineers since the 1950s. Uh, so uh, that area today is approximately, Andy, 20 feet above uh, because it's been filled not only up to tidal level, it's been filled above that. And it's approximately 20 feet above grade today. And with subsidence, that, that 1836 surface is probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 feet below sediments that are out there today. There was unlikely any archaeology done starting in the 1950s when they began filling that in. And that, uh, that disposal area is, is quite a large area with a, a lot of soil on top of it. We're aware of that, uh, but going back 60 years ago, uh, I seriously doubt any work was ever done there. I just asked Shippo that. They're, they're not aware of anything. Thank you. Another question. Yes, sir. Yeah, Glenn Van Slyke from Harris County Attorney's Office. Excuse me, sir. If we can work the best of that would be all here. Okay. Yeah, Glenn Van Slyke with the Harris County Attorney's Office. I'm just here for some information. Um, your uh, press release says that this, is, uh, this project is going to benefit from uh, the use of material being removed for a private industry project near Morgan's Point. Can you tell us the name of that private industry project and what private industries would, uh, are involved in that project? 
Um, Andy, you want to address that because you probably have a better understanding of, the, of uh, uh, who all is involved with that project. I, I'm not as familiar with the construction project that's taking place downstream. Would, is it? Would you, would you like to at least identify? I, I'm not sure. I want to make sure that we get the name correctly on the on who we have contracted partner. Uh, it's for a project in the Barber's Cut Terminal. It's for a new um, dock project there. Whose dock project is it? What's it's the uh, Enterprise Pipeline. Enterprise Pipeline. Yes. Okay. And who's the dredging company that's operating this project? Uh, Weeks Marine. Weeks Marine? Yes. Okay. Uh, your press release says that uh, the park will be able to value, uh, will take advantage of services worth more than $1.5 million. Uh, by using this uh, hydraulically pumped fill. Where does that value come from? Who put that value on the services? Was that Weeks Marine? Or was that? No, that was myself. Uh, and the way I calculated that, and it's a rough estimate, it's probably low, is that we actually do marsh restoration like this on our own. Uh, we're doing a project right now at Galveston Island State Park because that area subsided and we've lost about 900 acres of marshland at Galveston Island State Park. So we're actually hiring a dredge to dredge sand up from the bottom of West Bay and rebuild marshes. And based on the cost of that, that's what I would estimate. If we hired a dredge to go out and dredge material, I think it would cost at least that. And, you know, that's not just the operation of the dredge, but also uh, the engineering involved, the surveys involved, and the permitting involved, and all that. What's the total estimated volume of the dredged material in cubic yards? I believe it's 325,000 cubic yards. Okay. Um, who determined that there's no toxic material in the dredged material? That was done by a private uh, firm that, uh, a lab, I mean, uh, the real... Can you tell us the name of the laboratory? No, I don't have that on the top of my head. Can you tell us who they were consulting for? Uh, Enterprise Pipeline, and um, the company that hired them would have been, uh, would have been their, con their environmental consultants. Now, I've got the data. Uh, who, who are their environmental consultants? <clears throat> It's Atkins Global. Okay. I've got the uh, data. I think we're free to share that, I believe. So I think I've already sent it to Jan DeVault. Okay. Um, and the other agencies involved in the permitting all have that data as well. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Another. Justin? Oh. Has, has anyone consulted with the. Uh, Republic of Mexico or the United States of Mexico about this project? No, sir, we have not. Do you have any estimate how many of their citizens are buried on this battleground? Uh, well, are you talking about within the perimeter of the of the state historic site or outside of the state historic site? No, in, inside the state historic site. No, I'm not sure we know that. Jim, we'll, we'll, right after this, we'll come back. Uh, if, if you don't mind, if I just have three questions. Yes, sir. Okay. First one is, from your uh, pictures today, especially the open map, and we have a 1910, we have a 1905, we have a bunch of old maps. Jeff Dunn, I think, has uh, as many old maps. In fact, he wrote the article in the Southwest Quarterly on the maps the same as him. Every one of them, even the 1913 map, I don't see any marsh around Boggy Pile. I see it in the other area. Now, I will admit that I spread misinformation. I was telling people that the marsh that y'all are creating today is much bigger than the marsh at that time. And looking back at the map since I made that statement, I was wrong on that. But I still don't see any information of any marsh being in the area of Boggy Bile. And I have depositions from Mexican soldiers that we translated. And they talk about going down the bank into the Bible. They ran along solid ground, and I think it's pretty clear. The Yoakum map shows it very well. We've got a 1910 map that shows it very well, that there was no marsh on Barbie, Boggy Bile, so I don't know why you're building the marsh up into the Bible, unless it's to bury the artifacts and the potential Mexican dead. I understand that that's very politically sensitive, that there might be Mexican remains in there, but I don't see why we, if we're trying to make the the marsh or the battleground be like it was in 1936. I'm not sure why you would put marsh where there was no marsh. Well, you've identified what we think is, is a very big challenge in this project or any future work that we do to try and uh, recreate a landscape as best we can. 
that has changed radically over the years. So the degree of subsidence that has occurred, it really makes it almost impossible to reestablish the contours and the lay of the land as it was in that time. Uh, the, the, one of the objectives, certainly, of this project is as best as possible get it back to a condition where people can see and visualize how the, how the battle played out. And with Andy's uh, design of this project and with the engineering work and studies that have taken place leading up to this, I think that uh, that has helped to uh, uh, establish that landscape as close as possible given the, the realities that we're facing today. And I don't know if that adequately addresses your, your question, but. I would just say it seemed like it would be easier not to put a marsh where there wasn't marsh. It would be less spill that you would have to put in there, and that would probably save most of the artifacts that are in that area. My second question, uh, in the Atkins report, which was done by their archeologists uh, that work for the company that's gonna do the engineering, they did do 13 borings, and three of them were in the boggy bio area, but one of them was on the existing road. So only two of those borings were actually in the area where we think the artifacts exist that we believe are gonna be buried by the dredge. And those two borings were three inches wide each, and they both reported that there was no artifacts found. They were only done to 10 feet depth, those two uh, borings in that area. Um, my understanding is this is the report that was approved by Texas Parks and Wildlife and sent to the Corps of Engineers stating that there would be no impact because no artifacts were found in those two small borings. And yet, Texas Parks and Wildlife has, has come out and said that they do not want to do archaeology in the area because of the potential that there are Mexican dead there and that all the artifacts that would be found with them would not benefit, would not be beneficial as far as interpreting the battle uh, because it would be the same stuff we would find outside of Boggy Bible. But those seem to conflict to me that, that Atkins said there's no artifacts in there and that's what they told the Corps of Engineers to get their uh, 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 basically uh, behind the scenes uh, section 106, not doing public in, in uh, 106, but just doing it in the office. It seems to me like saying there's no artifacts to the Corps of Engineers and then saying we don't want to excavate the site because there's Mexican dead in there and we don't want to disturb the Mexican dead and yes, we know there are artifacts with them, but we don't think it's worth disturbing the dead to get the artifacts. Those seem to conflict to me. You know, I'll probably call on one of our teams to help uh, with describe the objectives of, of the, uh, the boring project. But, but when, those, when those samples were taken, it's my understanding, it was not in an attempt to, to find or not find artifacts. It was simply trying to identify and locate at what depth that original landform in 1836 is in the current landscape, and then also analyze the, the sedimentation that has taken place and uh, be able to anticipate it, the compaction that was likely to occur, how much material we needed to bring on top of all of that to, to achieve our objectives and reestablish the marsh. So all of that work was essentially done to ensure that whatever steps we did take did no harm to the existing uh, uh, landscape or, you know, or the historic landscape from 1836. And, and I can buy into that. And that it's my understanding that's what was sent to the Corps of Engineers, and that's what they use as their basis for, for uh, approving the, uh, the uh, project without doing a, uh, a full 106 with public input. Uh, that, that's, that, that's not correct. The report was sent to the Corps to demonstrate that the depth of material that is in Boggy or Santa Ana Bayou, either, either place, wherever those cores were done, what the depth of that was and the fact that any work that would be done in marsh restoration would be above that. So anything that may be below there is going to stay that way and not be disturbed. Based on the design of the effort, based on the fact that we know that there is 8 to 10 feet 
of siltation and fill within both Santa Ana and the lower reaches of Boggy, anything that is there, not because there wasn't anything found in three cores, but anything that's there that may still be there after 170 some years is still there. But it won't be disturbed because we know that there is eight to 10 feet of fill on top of it and all the work that is going to be done will be on top of that fill. So the intent of that report was to demonstrate how deep those sediments were as, as Brent said a minute ago. Now in terms of how the 106 was done, once the core, and, and I will tell you, first of all, before I say this, I cannot speak for the core. As a, as a state employee, we are an applicant to the core for a permit. The core will have to speak for themselves, and they chose not to be here tonight. But the core determined based on the fact that there is eight to 10 feet of sediment, and that the project will occur above that sediment that there is no potential for adverse effect. Why? Because anything that may be there on those 1836 surfaces, which are eight to 10 feet down, will not be affected by this project. Uh, question three, I, I was asking, uh, I was curious, and, and I hope that it's absolutely true what everybody said, that if you are common thing here is that we all love this battleground and we all have a passion for it. My last question, uh, if indeed that's the case, and if 1836 restoration is truly our primary goal here, I'm curious, I know the master plan said to take out the reflecting pool. I know we did archeology span along the, the trees that were lining the entrance, uh, but the trees never got removed. We did the archeology span to remove them. I'm wondering about the pumping stations that have been built on the battleground, the really ugly, uh, visual, disturbing pumping stations. And why do we need two brand new residences built on the battleground, right where the 1820 uh, battle site is, where we went out there with the archaeologists from Georgia and found a lot of artifacts from the skirmish of, 18, the, of April 20th. That's where we're going to put the two new homes on the park. Now, those things don't seem to be consistent to me that the restoration of the 1836 battleground is our primary goal. Here. And I'll shut up now. Th those are very good questions. You know, I mentioned earlier that uh, it's our goal to do no harm as we manage resources across the state to make our very special places, state parks, state natural areas, and historic sites accessible to the public. We must provide some degree of infrastructure or to accommodate that type of access. Oftentimes that includes utility systems, roadways, uh, structures, maintenance facilities. Uh, these, these support facilities are essential to be able to do that. We believe strongly that on-site residency is an important safety consideration at this site. As you know that uh, this site in particular is vulnerable to abuse and the, the response time, the, uh, the having uh, in, in our case the ability to provide state park police officers. These are officers with full authority to enforce laws of, uh, of this state and protect those resources. That is uh, very important to be able to, to be accessible uh, as difficult, and we find it difficult at times to construct that built environment and provide access to the site so that people can best experience it, learn from it, and hopefully grow in their appreciation for it, that it might actually influence the, uh, their life and the way they, they value resources, both natural and cultural. So those are difficult uh, balance that we have to strike. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're gonna look for every opportunity to minimize impact so I can say that we never have impacts on state parks because that's, or state historic sites or natural areas. It's simply not the case. We, but we try to do it in a way that's respectful, that accomplishes our goals and objectives. And, uh, and, and so by building this complex over there, getting our maintenance facility away from the Texan camp and getting our residences away from that area, we believe that we're actually benefiting the site with that, with that kind of a development project and, and not additionally harming it. I think Andy has something he wanted to address, perhaps in a previous question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. 
I, I just wanted to, to clarify, the reason an archaeologist looked at the core samples were just in case uh, these, where these samples went down, there's a very small chance, you know, because they're a very small core, that they could have hit and captured uh, uh, an artifact. And so we had to have an archaeologist look through those core samples to make sure there were no artifacts in them. They weren't done to characterize the, uh, the artifacts that may be present on the bottom of the of the of the, the bayou there. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Yes. Oh. My name is Jeff Dunn, and uh, yeah. I was uh, appointed to the St. Jacinto Historical Advisory Board by Governor Bush back in 1996. I was reappointed by Governor Perry and served till 2007, and was chairman from 2000 to 2007. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think uh, a very important part of, uh, that, that is a very important feature that's been omitted so far is uh, about the Section 106 procedure that was talked about. Uh, the way that procedure is supposed to work is if there are any potential impacts on historic resources, and that's, only, that's the only trigger, a potential impact on historic resources, you go through a consultation process, not only with the State Historic Preservation Officer, but also with ordinary citizens that had an interest and concern. I would say everybody in this room probably would have been interested in being a considered party. Everybody would have had something to add to this process. And that <coughs> somehow got skipped over. It never was done. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife could have initiated that. that. That could have been initiated even without a Section 106. But going through that consulting process is a way to check your work, to, to, you know, everything that you've done here may have been perfectly fine. There may have been a great consensus to it, but the whole idea is to, is to draw upon public concerns and public issues uh, so that any issues can be addressed and dealt with. And if there is a, uh, an adverse impact or potential for an adverse impact, that's where you get into uh, compromise and you try to work this out. That step somehow got skipped. I find it just almost incredible that you, we can say that just because there's silt there, and this is going to go on top of the silt, that therefore you can lead to the conclusion that there's no adverse effects on anything dealing with the site, and have that and have that be clear. You know, I, I, I'm not an archaeologist, but I'm aware that over time artifacts tend to blow it up to the top. And who knows what happens to some of those artifacts. So some of those artifacts may actually be in that 10-foot silt area, as far as we know. Um, and, you know, as Ruth mentioned in her, in her report, there, was, there has been no archaeological survey of this project area. Not one has ever been done. And I think that's what a lot of, what is driving a lot of the concern here is the fact that that's just being uh, assumed that we're not going to do it, and, and therefore, it's okay to put even more stuff on top of it. Uh, not to mention the fact that the impact of the Mexican soldiers, y'all may be exactly right. It may be exactly the best way to deal with this is to leave whatever remains are there and put this on top of it. It may not disturb them and it may be the best way, but part of the consulting uh, party process is to flesh all that out. Uh, it was mentioned about contacting the Mexican government. These are Mexican soldiers. And, you know, maybe they might have uh, an input into how they want to do this. Uh, one thing I think we do know is that as soon as we start dumping more uh, spoil on the site, it's going to make it much more difficult to uh, try to find these bone soldiers, artifacts later on. So, again, I don't see how that could be uh, no adverse effect. And by skipping over the public consultation process, uh, we avoid all that. And in fact, this meeting wouldn't be, this meeting is somewhat like damage control, I guess, because, you know, all this should have happened a year ago. Uh, and as part of this whole consulting process, this is what it's all supposed to be about. Uh, you've also got the levee, you know, that containment levee is going to be five, six feet high. It's supposed to be wide enough for a, a truck to go over it. Uh, that's not restoration. That's not part of the 1836 landscape. And for better or worse, that's going to have an adverse effect. Uh, you look at the landscape too, and the information that I received from the Texas Historical Commission indicates 
that the commission never even looked at what they call the historic fidelity of the site of the plant. They weren't looking at, at whether or not the overall uh, landscape would be changed. Instead, what's happening here is we're introducing a new feature that isn't, that isn't there today, that we know was not there in 1836. That creates an adverse effect under Section 106. And why didn't anybody notice that? Um, it was also mentioned about the toxicity of the soil, and it's mentioned uh, about well, you're going to look at contaminants. But you know, the real issue that I think is going on right now is you got the hobsons in St. Jacinto River, and is that is that being tested for too? Uh, because it appears, you know, just me as a layman. Uh, if uh, the options are flowing around the St. Jacinto River, the, the, the marsh area is outside of the flow of the river and may actually not be contaminated. If we're bringing in this dredge spoil from the site uh, by Morgan's Cut uh, and Morgan's Point and bringing it up here, are, is there a possibility of taking dioxin uh, uh, soil and, and putting it into a site that uh, was, was not previously contaminated with that. It's not real clear exactly how that's going to, going to shake out, and I think that could create a really serious problem, not only just for visitors, but, you know, suppose people wanted to do the archaeology uh, 50 years from now. It, it's almost like foreclosing an opportunity to do that. And even also with respect to the historical work that went into this, I, you know, it's very impressive with the, with the maps. Uh, but it was mentioned that the first really good topographical map was uh, the 1913 Corps of Engineers. I'm familiar with that. But actually, there was a survey done by the Harris County surveyor, uh, Bringhurst, in 1847. And in fact, they even published an article about it. And I, I don't see any information about that in any of the presentations or the, or the Atkins Archaeological Report. The Atkins Report didn't even mention the 1913 Corps of Engineers map. So, you know, I'm not trying to be critical of all this. I'm just trying to say that if this had gone through the Section 106 consulting party process, which is what, which is what that law is supposed to create, uh, a mechanism for public participation, whatever you're doing a federal undertaking like this that impacts an historic site, especially one of this magnitude, it, it just... You know, to me, that would be a prerequisite and that everybody should want to do that. Uh, you know, one aspect of this is um, you've got the, uh, uh, the State Historic Preservation Officer, Mark Wolf, who was mentioned. And, uh, you know, what role, I mean, this, we're talking about 147 acres here, and uh, I think it was mentioned 325,000 cubic feet of stuff's going to come in here. That's a pretty big uh, change to the site. And, uh, you know, I understand it's all been it's supposed to be beneficial. We're, we all want to, at least I'm personally in favor of restoration. I've been a big advocate of restoration of the site uh, for the entire time I've been uh, involved in it. But, that, but that's a big project, and um, from what I've been able to see uh, through the Texas Historical Commission was they were focusing on very narrow things, and uh, I'm not so sure how much that it was, the, these other issues really were focused upon. And I just, don't, I just don't understand why the 106. And that's really what a lot of people are asking for now, is that before you go out there and change the landscape, uh, have an opportunity for people to, to participate in this, have a moratorium on the project long enough so that, so that uh, we can go through this consultation process and satisfy some of the concerns that have been raised. Mr. Dunn, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, all those comments. I, there are many questions or opportunities to address many things that you said. I'll, t I'll take a stab at a couple of those things. Bill, could you do me a favor and pull up that slide that uh, shows the profile that Andy has, uh, established with the with the uh, light brown or kind of orange layer of material that will be deposited over this area, over this project area. Uh, while you do that, I'm going to call upon a couple of other people to help me, uh, certainly Bill Martin from the, uh, from the Historical Commission, to address some of the process-related questions that, that you brought up and concerns. But um, I think to me, essentially as a layperson, I'm not a trained archaeologist and I'm not a biologist like Andy, and I'm, you know, they, I feel like our team, and, and they're representing many different disciplines, have done their due diligence to ensure that 
the, the work that is taking place to restore this marsh is not going to do harm to the underlying uh, uh, artifacts that may be there. And so uh, this helps, in my mind anyway, to put this project in perspective. It's kind of like placing the icing on the cake. There is a lot of deposited material that is that, that came after the historic events of 1836. So having said that, I believe, I agree with you, that it is, it, it's incumbent on us as the, the department that is submitting and pursuing a permit for a project like this to do our due diligence. Now I'm satisfied, I believe that we have done that. Uh, there may, there obviously is some differences of opinion about that. But the process is built, as I understand it, to, to help protect uh, the resources, certainly, and that you have uh, other sets of eyes that get to be, uh, to, to take a look at uh, the project design and the research that's gone into it in advance uh, to ensure that uh, we have taken all steps required and necessary to ensure that we're not uh, having an adverse effect on that. And so, Bill, would you like to speak to the, to the process, perhaps uh, the questions that were, that Mr. Dunn raised? Uh, yes, you brought up a, a good question about the Section 106 process, and I just want to clarify that under the Section 106 process, any member of the public that wants to be involved as a consulting party uh, is directed to consult with the federal agency. And so in this instance, it's not Parks and Wildlife, it's the Corps of Engineers. And I know I've seen a letter from a few years ago where someone in your group did ask to be a consulting party, and I, as I understand it, the Corps never responded. I, I don't know why, unfortunately, they're not here tonight, and that's a good question for them. But I will point out that even though you can request consulting party status, there's nothing in the regulations that forces them to grant you that status. And, and usually federal agencies do, but I've had a couple of instances in the past year where other districts of the Corps of Engineers have uh, refused to admit uh, members of the public that had requested that status in. I've talked to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation in Washington, which oversees and wrote the regulations for the Section 106 process, and they will be happy to get on the phone with people and encourage agencies to allow people to be consulting parties, but they don't have any, rule, any role under the regulations that allows them to force the Corps to do that. So even though on most, I'd say most large-scale projects like this, we do have groups that are interested and there are public meetings held or some type of back and forth it is up to the federal agency to make that determination. Thank you, Bill. There's one thing that, that, uh, that, that I also want to add, and that's about tonight's meeting. You know, um, frankly, this was not scheduled. I asked our team to pull this meeting together based on feedback that I was receiving. Concerns. Con because it's my hope that, that the work of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in any stewardship endeavor that we take is supported and well understood. And it was my sense that it was, that there was perhaps some misunderstanding or misinformation that perhaps we didn't all have the same uh, benefit that I had, I thought, that from some of the, some of the, the, the pre-work that had been done by our department and some of our con uh, contracted partners. And so I asked our team to pull this meeting together. Now, I realize that the project is underway. We can go out there and we can see it. It's underway right now. It's never been my belief that, uh, that the meeting, the, the purpose of the meeting tonight was to, uh, to change the course of the project, but to address your concerns. Because it's really important to me that you have confidence in your Texas Parks and Wildlife Department as stewards of the resources. And to the extent that we can, we want to be completely transparent and let you know exactly what the rationale behind the project was and what we're thinking about. And why I believe I have so much confidence in our team in this project and, what's, and why I think that we're not going to have an adverse effect on these resources. I think it was really important for us to have this conversation. Now whether or not everyone leaves the room 
uh, convinced, then uh, I hope that's the case, but I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, that's realistic. But the, but the point is, your, your views do matter. The, you, we have people in this room that have tremendous amount of knowledge of Texas history, in particular this site, and um, a long history of stewardship. And we appreciate that very much. So I, I appreciate all your, all your comments. I just wanted to make sure that it was understood why are we having this meeting and who called it and what is its purpose. And I don't want to be disingenuous. I want to be very upfront and clear that the project's moving forward and it has already begun. But it was, it was permitted appropriately and uh, supported, concurred with by the, by the THC. And so we felt. Now, having said all that, and I was going to save this for some closing remarks, and I'm not trying to prematurely end this. Uh, I think it's really important that we always look for opportunities to improve our process, to communicate what we're doing as stewards over your resources. San Jacinto Battleground and State Historic Site belong to, t belong to you. They be belong to the people of Texas. We just happen to be interested in the stewardship. And we want to be completely clear about the rationale that led to this project being initiated and why we feel uh, strongly that it's, that it's a good project. Um, so I just want to say that. Uh, there's opportunity for us to improve the way we communicate these projects. One of the things I, I've contemplated today is that um, perhaps an, an annual report uh, on all the activities, all the projects, capital construction, development projects, restoration projects, you name it, anything that's taking place at this site that we produce some kind of document, some kind of report that all stakeholders can see. Whether you're a, a, a formal partner with this department or just an interested citizen, we want you to be able to see that. And so you have my commitment. We're going to do something very similar to that. But we also realize sometimes projects will emerge in between that annual report that we hope to develop. And it's important that we share that information, that uh, we not wait and react to an outcry of concern to hold a meeting. I'd rather do it on the front end so it's very clear to everybody what we intend to do because our intention is absolutely to be the best steward of this site that we can. It's, it's incumbent that we do that. Future generations of Texans expect that and um, or well current generations of Texans expect that. It's a standard that uh, we, we uh, eagerly accept so uh, thank you for that. Uh, Jan, I thank you. No, and actually uh, I think this is on but uh, Mr. Martin, I'm probably the one with, uh, well, actually, I think I directed our attorney to write that one and six letter. We have consulted with the Corps several times on different projects. Now, the fact that they chose to ignore us does not, should not have prevented you all from doing something. And I'll say it, I've said it in emails, I'm going to say it publicly. Shame, shame on the state agency who are, who, and you're, you're on the right track. We've got to have communication. There has to be communication. There's projects going on out here that we don't know about, and we do care. And groups like ours, and some, I know some of these folks in the audience know they have a tremendous amount of knowledge. They're willing to share it for free. But um, I, I'm right now very disappointed in the Texas Historical Commission and Texas Parks and Wildlife because we went two years thinking this project was dead. And everyone knows who we are. I'm going to give this to our attorney, actually. Leslie, and please explain the 106 process. Well, I'm, I'm going to make a couple of comments, and I have a question. So it'll lead to a question. Um, first, I think Jeff and Jan and other folks have spoken very well about the 106 process, but I, I do want to point out, because I think there is a very important absence in this meeting, is that the statutory responsibilities for 106 are on the Army Corps of Engineers to comply with this 50-year-old Texas law and actually on the Texas Historical Commission. Uh, although as applicant, you know, the Texas Parks and Wildlife should be consulting with the Corps as well to notify the core of people who need to be involved. 
the Texas Historical Commission has a legal responsibility to consult with the core to advise them on people who should be brought in as consulting parties. Um, so going forward, both agencies need to make a better effort to bring people in. And, it, and actually for the state, it's a requirement. Um, it's deeply disturbing that the Army Corps of Engineers is not here. We did ask for consulting party status. I've been involved in core projects going on 15 years. It is not unusual not to hear back from the Corps for two years because it takes so long within their review process, especially on complex projects, for anything to get done. When we finally heard about this recently and I contacted the Corps, I was astonished to be informed by the project archaeologist that he looked at things himself and did the little internal review and everything was fine and that he determined that the qualities that made the battlefield eligible for the National Register were not being impaired. Well, for the Army archaeologists not to know that this is a National Historic Landmark and also listed on the National Register is inconscionable, which invokes an even higher level of six review, which has not been done. Um, to move forward on my question now. I'm not sure how one can say there's not going to be any harm if you really don't understand what the potential resources are. Because a harm is not just direct destruction. It's, for example, preventing future or impairing future interpretation and opportunity for education, even if the resources are going to be left in place. And simply because in another area, land disposal was allowed before there were any regulatory requirements, in my mind, almost makes this an adverse cumulative effect by putting more land disposal on the site, which will further prevent any kind of evaluation. So my question now is with all the work that was described that's been done on the site, knowledge of native soil properties, knowledge of locations and densities of artifacts and sites, what sort of predictive work was done to do any kind of evaluation of the potential for locations and densities of sites given all the native soil work that Mr. Uh, your staff person described uh, of knowledge of the native soils under the site. Because I would think at minimum, and I have clients that do this work, so I know it's done, you would have wanted to do some kind of predictive evaluation of what was there that was going to be affected uh, irreversibly by this project. And if it wasn't done, why wasn't it done? Because that's when you start to understand what the resources are and what the potential for harm is. Perhaps um, somebody from our team can also address this, but I think it's an effort of avoidance of impact. I mean, we are, we were, all of the, the work that was done was to determine where we can safely operate and work to reestablish uh, a landscape that's consistent with 1836 and have no effect. I mean, uh, and I think that's what all that pre-work did. It, it was to avoid the potential for that effect and so we stay away from that. So is there perhaps somebody that is a better position to address this than me? But. It, we're not just talking about physical effect. The inability to understand and interpret in the future is itself an effect. Okay, I, okay, and I, I did, I do remember you saying that, and I appreciate that, that you remind me of that, because this is an important aspect and objective for this project, because we believe that it's actually adding value to our, and, and adding to our ability to interpret the events of, in, in April of 1836. So, go ahead. Perhaps from a landscape effect, but what about from an interpretive, Resources. from an interpretive standpoint, let me say this: bringing bringing an element of the landscape back, it can't be the exact landform because that landform is gone. It's 10 to 13 feet gone. It will never come back in our lifetimes. So what we are doing is we are recreating the scene as best as we understand it based on the biological research that Andy Sippix and his predecessor, Ted Hollingsworth, did. Uh, over the years in, in looking at maps or versus looking at aerial photographs. Maps can be just uh, imagery as opposed to actuality, which is what we were basing the marsh restoration. I'll let Andy answer that in a minute, but we're basing it on 1930 and the fact that there was in 1930 and as early as 1913, there was open water in there. So we do know that there was marsh in the lower reaches of Boggy. 
what was done predictively, we know from documents, which a number of people here in the audience know just as well as any, and, and more than anybody else, that there is most likely the remains of Mexican soldiers in there. We don't need to do predictive modeling based on, on the historic documentation. We have a pretty good idea that that's what's in there. However, putting two feet of soil on top of eight to 10 feet of soil has no adverse effect on those remains. They are still there, they will be undisturbed. From a landscape perspective, restoring that scene, allowing us to continue interpretation in a greater, more detailed way. I will tell you that the very first time I came here, and I have been doing battlefield archeology span for 30 years now, I came here, I had a very difficult time understanding how things flowed across this landscape. I got a very detailed tour from Ted Hollingsworth, Andy's pre uh, predecessor, and unless Ted had gone over every step of the way and explained how the landscape had changed, even somebody who understands battlefields, I'd worked at Manassas back in 30 years ago, you've got to have the scene to really understand it. And I have seen a lot of battlefields that look very different today. I lived uh, on, on Murfreesboro, on the, the Battle of Stones River. And that one is an incredibly difficult battle to understand because there's shopping centers in the middle of it. We don't have a shopping center here, but we don't have a marsh either. The marsh was the, 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 the biggest, and unfortunately Peggy Lake's not there either. Those two landscape elements were some of the, had some of the greatest impact on what occurred there the days of, uh, uh, the day of 18, uh, April 21st, 1836. So from an interpretive standpoint, being able to put that marsh back and interpret to the public, from little children to adults, to people who were on the cannonball tour, I'm one of them, on the cannonball tour regularly, to understand how the Texas landscape affected the outcome of the Texas Revolution. There is no adverse effect, and you would get an argument from a lot of people, including myself and other people who do battlefield archaeology, that restoration of the scene is not an adverse effect. From a standpoint of human remains and anything that associated with those human remains, there is no adverse effect because we are not touching them. They are staying there where they are, eight to 10 feet below. Somebody said earlier about artifacts rising to the surface. I highly doubt it, frankly. We have seen that in these other soils because those soils are above water, they are, they are dry land, and those soils do churn. But under the water, they're not gonna have the same churning effect. Now, with all of that said, I'm gonna let Mr. Martin answer the, the section 106 parts of your questions. And, and I wanna be clear when I talked about losing the opportunity for interpretation and understanding, I wasn't talking about the landscape component. I'm talking about the buried cultural items, artifacts, remains. I mean, just 50% of the party, right? Uh, after Bill finishes, I, I can try to answer that as well. We don't think it's an adverse effect. I mean, I can see a lawyer arguing that that would be a cumulative effect, but this much fill on top of eight feet. Uh, honestly, I've talked to several professional archeologists and asked, you know, what, would, what do you think of this? And nobody uh, who works on a regular basis in CRM work thinks that this would be an adverse effect or that it would warrant excavation. The concept about artifacts moving up, if that were the case, we would not probably, depending on what it was, in this case, because it's such an important battle, we might, but usually if artifacts are moving like that, we don't want, they've lost their context and we can't study them effectively. So, you know, that in and of itself wouldn't trigger any further excavation. Um, and in terms of uh, what our agency is required to do, I, I have a copy of the regs with me. Maybe you can show me where we're required to, to tell them who to consult with, you know, what members of the public. I, I think our only statutory requirements are to um, assist in Section 106 review and to uh, do National Register nominations if you look at the law. So uh, that's about all I've got. To, to answer the question about adverse effect on, on potential for artifacts and things, 
th th that's a non-starter because archaeological sites by nature are underground. They all are underground. There are uh, currently how many unknown millions of archaeological sites across the entire state park system. We will probably never ever know every archaeological site on every property. This particular state historic site is entirely an archaeological site. There are remains out there from that one event of April 2021, 20, 1836. There are also things out there that, that are thousands of years old that are on the shore of, uh, former shore of Peggy Lake and of the river. Those things are also being left in place and we are not touching them. To remove them is the number one thing that any archeologist learns as an undergraduate is you had best have a good research design and reason to remove artifacts from the ground. Because once you do, you have taken every single artifact out of its context. Archaeology is by nature, and this is a direct quote that every freshman in college learns, archaeology by nature is a destructive process. You will find that in every introductory text. You will find that in every graduate level text. So to, to say that leaving them there is an adverse effect is not correct. An adverse effect is actually taking artifacts out of the ground. And the SHPO will, will tell you that that sometimes is used as, as mitigation, but that is better than a shopping mall being put on top of an archeological site. So the archeology span is done in a scientific way. They require a, uh, a research design that answers very specific types of questions, looking at patterns of hum human use through time, et cetera, depending upon the size and age of the archaeological site. Yes, sir. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, ask this question to Mr. Martin. He's over Texas Historical, and I want to say they did a tremendous job with the staff they had, which is very, very limited, and they're trying to do everything. Now, every time I've ever called up there, they help me with things that I'm working on. I did want to say on the situation, there's one that she asked about an adverse effect. Here's one of the effects we didn't realize. The Madame Morris Battalion, which was pushed into Peggy Lake there at the end of the battle, is the same battalion that polluted the bodies right in front of the Alamo and took all the artifacts. You're not only taking Mexican artifacts up, you're also taking artifacts that were at the Alamo. And I'm sure there's people that were in the Alamo with their families and, and think about what they went through to save Texas would like to see some of those artifacts come to life. That is a preservation that needs to be done for those particular artifacts. And, and I know it's changed. We did Matterport Bay with the Bell, $10 million project. I don't think it would cost us $10 million to do a 50-50 uh, coffer dam out there and just see what would happen if anything's there. If it's nothing there, and we don't have to worry about it, fill it back in. But if we find some artifacts like Jim Bowie's knife or William Travis's pistols or David Crockett's rifle, I think we would look at procedures to go farther. Thank you. Yes, Andy. Uh, I did. I did want to to make sure um, uh, folks with the San Jacinto Battleground know that uh, the letter you sent us was provided to the Corps, so they did have your objections a couple years ago. So, and also this project was previously permitted through the full public review process, and this is an ongoing. What public review process? This was from an individual permit in 1997. Yes, and part of this process of doing this the right way is waiting for us to have the right kind of uncontaminated material to use. It takes time to do that. So really, this is a, I think what, I, I can't speak for the core, but um, you know, there, there was a process that was gone through. It was their decision whether to, you know, it was their decision on how to do this. So we, we weren't hiding anything from them. You know, we knew there were people that were um, that wanted to have additional input. The Corps made the decision that they made. Um, also, again, I, I want to point out that we're not doing anything that is irreversible. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Marcel Bryant. I've kind of got several issues. What is this webcast going to be available? We're not filming it, so I don't know. Okay. For those who can't can't be here, uh, <clears throat> I understand about the, the the idea that freshman archaeology. Although I'm not a trained archaeologist, 
that, that yeah, sometimes you don't touch things or you don't remove them, but we didn't seem to have a problem with pulling up the coal of bell and the remains of the sailor uh, out of Matagorda Bay. And I don't think anything's left from Matagorda Bay. But, you know, have we done any case on work or even an attempt to do any case on work in any of these submerged areas or inundated areas? And, and you know, whether we, you know, with the thought of treating the Mexican dead, you know, uh, accordingly and with other artifacts, and like this gentleman said, you know, if we're really going to understand the flow of the battle, we we, we got to dig this place up. Um, and, that, you know, it's like the Civil War battles or whatever, you know, whether you're pulling up musket balls, bayonets or whatever, you got to dig the place up, put it back like you found it, but, but keep records because, like, like you said earlier, this is our <coughs> monument, and, it, and it's every bit as important as the Alamo. And, you know, nationally speaking, it's probably even more important than the Alamo when you look at history. And uh, I'd just like some comments on that. And, and maybe Ruth, who's the, the local archaeologist, can address, you know, what have they found? Because I don't think she told us what they have found. Um, you know, and if she could share that with us, I'd appreciate it. Okay, I'll allow, I'll allow one of our archaeologists, Ruth or Michael, either one, whichever you prefer, to to address that. I I will say that. Uh, pardon me. Oh, um, we want to know all we can know. With re and, and and I'll actually ask Michael to address this issue because you were, you you talked about the potential for human remains. Uh, we actually have policies within our department uh, with regard to that issue, and certainly we have reason to believe that there's a likelihood that we would encounter that here. So, Michael, do you want to address a policy issue related to to, uh, to human remains and, and that potential? Yeah. We, we have a policy that dates to 1999 to, to leave human remains in the ground and respect them where they are uh, unless there is a compelling reason to remove human remains or do something uh, to, to change the nature of where they are. In some cases, human remains that have been found are washing out will get covered in the soil and they will be left uh, to, to, to rest where they are. <clears throat> in terms of what is potential, uh, in Boggy Bayou, in Santa Ana Marsh, or what would have been potential in Peggy Lake, yeah, there's, there's human remains there. We, we know that. We, we know for a certain that there are a lot of dead men on this ground. Let me remind everybody that they are foreign war dead. They are not anything that any American citizen has any control or ownership over. They are the, the souls of the nation of Mexico and of the Mexican military. In regards to American soldiers, we have a policy from the United States military regarding and of our dead on foreign soil. And I'm sure Mexico does as well. In 2001, the nation of Mexico sent their ambassador here to San Jacinto. And in, uh, I forget what part of time of the year it was, but they conducted a wreath laying ceremony here so that the nation of Mexico could finally on their own terms, put their warriors to rest on, on what is now American soil. Let's remember at the time, this was Coahuila y Tejas. This was the northernmost state of, of, uh, uh, of Mexico. So the, the nation of Mexico has already recognized they're dead here. Uh, Jan is shaking her head no. Yeah, that's not right. I, I, can send you, I can send you the link of the, the news article uh, about it. Uh, okay, we, there was a funeral mass here. There was a funeral mass in 2002. Okay, so there was, a, then you may there be was, correct. You there, was, be there, correct. Was, there was a, a wreath laying ceremony in 2001. Right. There was a funeral mass in 2002. That was done by a number of dioceses and parishes out of the Galveston district. That was a completely different event. That was an American event. In 2001, it was the, the Mexican ambassador who came here. So for us to talk about removing foreign war dead is not something that we as a state entity are going to do we would have to enter into negotiations with the State Department and the, the, the Mexican State Department or, or whatever the, that federal agency is and the Mexican military. And they may or may not want to do anything. They already demonstrated in 2001 that they've laid their, 
their military men to rest officially. Very quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not clear. The Atkins report that I read said that because the silt was going to not hold the soil, they said that they were going to put four meters, 13 feet of dredge on the site. That's what they said. And y'all are saying two feet. I'm not saying you're wrong. Which is it? Is it 13 feet of, of dredge or is it two feet of dredge? Ruth, I would you like go. to answer that you, question. You, my I made a mistake. I said four meters. Andy told me four feet. We were talking back and forth about the, the potential of impacting any human remains. And I said, well, how deep is the area? And he said, oh, it's about, you know, the whole area is probably about 12 to 15 feet, you know, uh, in depth. And so I said, so how much are we going to be putting on it? And he said at that time, as you saw, he said it had silted in a lot quicker than what he thought. And he told me four feet. And so I went back to my typewriter, or my computer, and I typed in four meters. And so Adkins got that information from me. I gave them wrong information. And so what you received is a draft report. And so we have told Adkins that it's not four meters. It's more like a foot and a half to two feet. Did that answer your question? This is a perfect example of why I think this meeting needed to occur. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mike Lehman. My great-great-grandfather was in the Battle of San Jacinto, and my great-great-uncle was one of the nine who died. And uh, I just, I appreciate all, all that you've shown. Um, and I like the idea of having a battleground look like it did then, but I still feel like there's greater public policy of not bringing ship channel material and putting it on the battlefield. And I do feel like if there ever is a desire to uh, do some archaeological work and find out what's under the ground, that you're just making it more difficult and more expensive. Thank you, sir. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Can I get an answer on what has been found? Uh, Ruth, you want to address that? Sure. Can, Bill, can you take it back to the overall uh, compared to the Yoakum? Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to tell you which areas. <laughs> we all know it's a battleground, and so there's battle-related artifacts out there. There's also historic artifacts, because we know that before the battle occurred, it was Peggy McCormick's land, and, you know, she was a farmer, and she had stuff, right? So we find stuff from that era, and we find battle-related stuff, things like musket parts, pistol parts, cannonballs, uh, grape shot, musket balls, uh, belt buckles, spurs. Uh, we find all kinds of things. So, and they're both Mexican and they're both American, Texan. So, and then so uh, after the battle, right, immediately after the battle, uh, things started to be accumulated by onlookers, visitors, those people who like to go pick up stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And um, so the, after that, so these people are out there picnicking and gathering and bringing the children. And so we found little dolly parts and we found uh, rancher spurs and we found things from beyond the era of the battleground on up. It's a continuous use uh, site. I mean, from the time uh, Peggy McCormick was there all the way through till today. So uh, a lot of times I come out here with my little metal detector because the hogs have been out there digging the site up. Do, I, do we have any control over the hogs? No. So I go out and I metal detect. And when I metal detected 90% of these hog wallows, I have found pop tops. I have found bottle caps, aluminum cans, uh, gum wrappers. Uh, nails, pieces of chain off of some of the lawnmowers that we used to, you know, so you name it, we have found it. And so, is all of this stuff in context? 
No, it's not. There's a lot of the stuff that we find that is out of context. In other words, it's been picked up as fill, moved to another part of the park to fill in a low-lying area or to create a road. And sometimes over time, those roads have been degraded and then scattered around. So there's a lot of artifacts out there, and yet we have found, and that's what those soil tests will tell us, is whether or not what we're looking at is intact or not. And intact means where they dropped it when they were running, or where they dropped it, or where whatever they had, like they dropped a spur, or their horse threw a shoe, you know, some of those things are exactly where they were, but a lot of them are not. Any other questions regarding that? Do we, do we have that data that can be, sh that information that's in context that can be shared with the public? Um, you mean, in, we have reports, I think those are. Or, or on display, or, or do we have the artifacts? We have the artifacts at our lab in Austin. Okay, at your lab in Austin. Yeah. And um, Michael, you want to address this because I'm not sure. Can well, they I come? Just want to know when is it? When is it going to be made? You said it's available to us, but but I mean, do I go to on Amazon and get it? Or, or, where, where do I go? I don't Help me out. Uh, the the reports the reports are available uh, that uh, typically <coughs> excuse me typically we we don't give out site locations to the general public. That information is protected. We protect that information and the, the, the Historical Commission generally uh, assumes that that is protected because we don't want members of the general public coming out onto our state historic sites or our parks and looking for artifacts. What we can tell you is that in the middle of the battleground, we have found evidence of the battle itself. But I will tell you from a professional standpoint, I don't think we know exactly where the middle of that battle is yet. We haven't found that. We've done a lot of work in and around the area, but I can tell you one of the things that happened is this building. This building and all the construction around it did a fair amount of damage. And I, and I think that we, we have, based on, on the work that we have done, we've only hit the very edge of it. There's still a lot more that could be done out there in the middle of the battlefield to try and find the middle of where that battle occurred. There were a lot of dropped artifacts we have found very few actual fired musket balls. Man, I'm losing it. Um, so that work is, is, is still potential to be done. In terms of uh, how much more we could learn by doing that kind of work, <clears throat> I think we could learn a lot. I think one of the other things that could and should be done <clears throat> is to hire a Mexican historian to go to Mexico into those archives. I could use my academic contacts and to do a lot of that background research that could be done and the questions that are being asked of us and are being asked of the things here. Uh, what did the Casadores carry with them? What were certain insignia? What did they look like? Whether they were lapel pins or they were embroideries. That kind of information could be found through archival work. So we still have a lot that we could do. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot that could be done. Brent will tell you that I've had a number of conversations with him my goal for this site would be to hire an archaeological staff for a number of years to be able to fully inspect and, and do this place right. We've been picking at it piecemeal with, with contract archaeology, and that is, that is not working real well, frankly. If we could do it that way, but it takes funding and it takes FTEs, none of which have we ever had in order to, to, to be able to do that correctly. Can, can I ask you one more question? The uh, final disposition of the Mexican can that was on the battlefield, is there any determination where that went to? And secondly, when are we going to get our Alamo flag back? Michael addressed something that uh, I'd like to build upon something that he said. And that is doing the best we can with what we have, where we are. Teddy Roosevelt said that. I think it's something that we try to do ourselves. Uh, I know it is something that we try to do ourselves. There is much more information to be gained here. There is a great deal of investigative work that can be done here. 
And oftentimes, dialogue, conversations like this, some good things can happen out of that. And, and I hope that this is, tonight is an example of that. I hope that, that uh, there is a renewed commitment amongst us all to work together to, to gather that information to be the best possible stewards for this site. And so uh, with that said, you know, my hope is that we, as we go into this next legislative session, that we make a compelling case about the need for additional resources, whether historians, archaeologists, or we, those are the things that are so important. We got to have the resources to do this. We also need to use partnerships to do this and accomplish much of this. Much of the, the work that's been done in prairie restoration and marsh restoration and, 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 and other initiatives on this site and across your park system is done through partnership because it grows our capacity to accomplish much more. And so I hope that we all leave with a, with a commitment to consider how we might participate in that work because it benefits us and it benefits the generations that follow us. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you holding this meeting because I'm one of the persons that called and complained because I didn't know anything about it and I consider San Jacinto my home. In fact, I've been asked, why do all the Mexicans come over here for Easter? Well, they had come all over here because their ancestors were probably the ones that are in Peggy Lake. Now, that's a burial site. My, my thought is you need to put a copper down like this man said around it and let them do the digging. You've got Dr. Dimmick here who's a wealth of knowledge very respected in the Hispanic community. Uh, when he does his talks to the Hispanic genealogy groups, he's just loved by all. They can't get enough of him. He's a leading expert, recognized in the sea of mud. You need to consult with him, consult with all these people here. And Jan DeVault, my God, don't leave her group out. Don't leave us out, don't leave us out in the cold. Consult with us and ask us for our input. We care and we love San Jacinto. That's the common ground that I'm speaking to. I appreciate the comments. I mean, it, 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 it kind of reinforces what I think is so important. Yeah, it's really, really important. But, um, we're here for a blink of an eye. That, that's it. We're going to pass this on to the next generation, and they're going to do something with it. They're going to hopefully protect it, preserve it, continue a legacy with it uh, to the next generation. It's it's important that we, we gain as much information as we can, and we do it uh, in a responsible way, and using the best management practices uh, that we, and, and the best practices that we have available to us, doing the best we can with what we have. I thank you for coming tonight. The feedback's really important to us. Uh, you have my commitment that we're, we're gonna change course from this point on. I, I believe that there is, that we have a responsibility to share with you an annual report every year. What's going on at this site, but also what's going to happen? What's going to be happening in the near term, in the future? What is planned for this site? So that everybody knows. Uh, you have that commitment to, uh, from me. And uh, uh, you know, this, was, this meeting was pulled together very quickly. Our staff worked very hard to, to try and uh, bring this information together because they've been living it and breathing it uh, for a very long time. And, um, Jan, we should have done it. Uh, you have my commitment in the future. We're, we're going to be as transparent as good. this is your site. And we want to be the best stewards we can be. Uh, so thanks for coming tonight.